Good evening and welcome to another jam-packed volunteer forum uh, for the first for 2023 uh, January here coming to you from the Drew and West Fire Brigade in District 9. I'd like to start the volunteer forum as always to acknowledge the Aboriginal lands to which we're coming to you from tonight, recognise the Aboriginal elders past and present and the strength and resilience of Aboriginal people uh, in this land. A lot of uh, good information to come through and uh, as, as a jam-packed agenda, as always. Being the first uh, volunteer forum for the year, uh, again, wishing everyone, uh, that I hope you had a great Christmas uh, and New Year period. And, uh, and it's fantastic to be back with you all doing these forums for what I hope to be another fantastic year. Uh, tonight's forum uh, has a lot of uh, uh, information available, but we are focusing primarily uh, on community engagement and how important uh, the preparedness and preparation aspect of the PPR cycle uh, is on our Victorian communities and what CFA is doing uh, to ensure that we're getting the best out of uh, preparing our communities so they can uh, you know, really look after themselves in the event of a fire. I have a, a, a panel here this evening with us and a couple of, so, so, you know, Trevor Roberts, uh, the local ACFO at District 9. Welcome, uh, welcome Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, we've got Bruce Jewell, Alyssa Jans, thank you for, thank for you. coming along this evening. Uh, we've got Jude Kennedy, our local uh, MCS, Lucy Cerrone, uh, from uh, uh, Head of Community Preparedness, and, uh, and Boris Radicevic. Uh, thank you for, for coming. I hope I got that right. Again, you I do apologise. Yes, um, thanks for coming on the panel this evening, and we're going to talk about uh, community preparedness and how, and how uh, important that is. And on the end, Bruce, thank you uh, for coming pleasure. on this evening. And uh, again, again, you've got some great information for us. And I have. We're going to talk some, some really big things. Uh, Looking forward to it, Chief. Looking when it comes to community engagement uh, and the like. Um, we were at Australia Day. Uh, at, on Australia Day, we do many things. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that does happen, obviously, is we acknowledge uh, many award recipients from across uh, many of the, the community services, the community more generally, but also that is a day uh, where we release the Australian Fire Service Medals. And CFA recipients were, um, were dutifully recognised for their contribution to the Australian Fire Service uh, Medal. And tonight, uh, I would like to publicly acknowledge uh, our recipients, but Mark Cartledge, the Ballarat Fire Brigade. Uh, I know Mark uh, exceptionally well, and his absolute dedication and commitment to, to rescue, road safety and road safety awareness uh, is second to none, and likewise, uh, yeah, his uh, campaigning and um, and commitment uh, to di uh, to diversity and inclusion uh, and a child safe environment. So, congratulations, Mark. Uh, Neil Marshall from Panton Hill Fire Brigade, 60 years of operational service. Neil uh, has both served not only in the brigade environment but also as a board member uh, from '86 to '91 and has really been fundamental in the establishment and the operation of the AIM system uh, right across uh, CFA. Uh, Michael Rowe, uh, down at Cape Clear, what can I say, uh, is an absolute advocate uh, for planned burning and burning and uh, is well renowned for uh, making sure that our female members uh, really do get involved in, uh, in the practice of, of planned burning and the like, particularly through his Women Burn Camp. So uh, keep up the great work, Michael. You're doing a fantastic uh, a lot of work there and, and well, well deserving of the AFSM. Uh, Robert Toddy Small, Fern Tree Gully Fire Brigade, passion for training. Uh, his commitment and dedication to ensuring uh, that training takes place and, and always evolving uh, is second to none. And that's why uh, he's been awarded and received recognition for that. And then we've got Ken Stewart from Mount Taylor Fire Brigade. Again, another passion uh, advocate for, for mitigation plan burning. Uh, and preparation. So uh, these uh, you know, members right across CFA are real leaders uh, and to be commended and, uh, and recognised for their hard work and dedication over many decades uh, to their areas of passion. Uh, one final one I will call out, you won't see it on the screen there, uh, he's been uh, a, a part of CFA prior to fire services reform and that's uh, a shout out to Assistant Chief Fire Op Officer Tony O'Day. Uh, who was also recognised uh, by Australian Fire Service Medal. And Tony has spent uh, a lot of his career, most of his career in fact, uh, with CFA and is very dedicated to ensuring that volunteers uh, are looked after, increasing their capability uh, across the service. And now he's uh, with Fire Rescue Victoria uh, looking at interoperability. So again, making sure that CFA uh, and FRV work together on the fire ground. So once, uh, congratulations to all our recipients uh, and I wish them all the best and I know 
Uh, they are very proud and I know their families are even prouder of them. So if you see them uh, around, congratulate them. They are well deserving of their uh, awards. I also want to, uh, I guess, uh, after acknowledging the AFSM, just, I guess, uh, tell our people out there a little bit of sad news. Um, uh, some would recall uh, that we recently did a volunteer forum from Machuca, uh, where we talked about their 150 year uh, anniversary. And there was one panelist uh, in particular, uh, Alan Elvey, who, as many would recall, was actually born uh, in the Echuca Fire Brigade uh, in the station there. Well, unfortunately, uh, Alan has just recently passed and I had uh, the honour of attending his funeral with uh, many hundred uh, CFA uh, staff and volunteers to recognise the life and times uh, of Alan and, and really uh, celebrate the dedication that he has had to the Echuca community. And uh, a passionate advocate for fire investigation, uh, I, serve, I uh, issued to his family uh, on that day an outstanding service medal awarded by the board for his dedication and commitment to fire investigation. So um, I know many would remember him from, uh, from the panel, so I thought it was worth uh, mentioning that uh, this evening. I gave my commitment in November, uh, after we had the training uh, volunteer forum, that we would continue to update our members on what's going on in the space of training. And uh, Jean, true to her word, has put together the following package to give you a bit of an update on what they've been working on uh, and what they will be working on and some of their achievements since we last got together and spoke. So uh, over to you, Jean. Good evening. For those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Jean Diesel, the DCO for Operational Doctrine and Training. And moving forward from tonight, we will be bringing you an update on doctrine and training at every volunteer forum. We hope that you find this information informative and insightful. 2022 was a very big year for ODNT. In terms of operational doctrine, we updated and developed over 13 new pieces of doctrine. And of course, including the driving doctrine, which was a very big piece of work for us. We also developed and piloted a new process to, on how to review, maintain and develop our operational doctrine. From a training perspective, we also released several training courses that are now ready and available for delivery. Some of those courses, just to highlight a few, includes Rescue Operations, Breathing Apparatus Classic, Drive on Road, Hazmat Operator and the Fire Equipment Maintenance course. We know that many of you have a great interest in the AFAC peer review and from that point of view I'm very happy to report that we had several different meetings with our working groups and consultations. If you have a look at the screen now we had over nine sessions with our governance working group, more than 14 sessions working on a training pathway framework, over two sessions looking at operational capability and three sessions with our diversity and inclusion working group to ensure that all of the work that we've done throughout the 14 recommendations of the AFAC peer review includes diversity and inclusion principles. Our project control board also met on the 10th of December where they had a look at the considerations provided to them from the AFAC working groups. From a learning governance point of view, of course, this was a very big year for ODNT. Not only did we upgrade all of the courses from PUA 12 to PUA 19, we also ensured that there are now more compliant courses in terms of RPL assessments available for you to use. And very important for us was the fact that we concluded our VRQA re-registration audit. The outcome of the audit is not available yet, although it was a very positive experience for the team and I, and we are quite sure that we will get a really good audit result. In 2023, our priorities have changed. And currently our new priorities for January through to February in terms of the operational doctrine space is to have a look at the review and development and maintenance of our operational doctrine and the processes that support those. We are also coordinating CFA SME input, both from a staff and volunteer perspective, into our state common doctrine our JSOPs and so forth. And also important for us is currently to have a look at the asbestos doctrine and how we can update and review that. From a training course perspective, um, our focus currently is on respond to urban. So for those of you that have used the course before, known as our structural firefighting course. We also have a very keen and targeted focus on fire investigation courses. We are also looking at the last remaining 11 PUA 19 compliant RPL assessments 
and of interest for us is the Tree Hazard Assessor course. All of those courses will become our priority for January through to February. As far as the AFAC peer review is concerned, our current priorities is to update our website information after all of the working group meetings last year. We'd also like to finalise the Project Control Board recommendations and host further consultations, in particular around our scope of registration and our training pathways within CFA. For the Learning Governance team, their priorities remain the Audit Rectification Plan and a clear and targeted focus on language, literacy and numeracy for all of our members. Finally, we have a Save the Date event for all of our trainers and assessors. As you know, last year we commenced a professional development series for all of our CFA educators and are hoping to kick this off again in February this year. We generally run one session on a weekday evening and the same session is repeated on a Saturday morning. And to kick us off, we will start on the 16th of February, the 18th of February, with a session regarding assessment practices, reassessment, assessment decisions and model answers. We hope that you save the date and that you make use of those professional development opportunities with us. That's all for our update tonight. We will also later tonight be showing you and introducing our Vemtech campuses. We are hoping to provide a short video of each Vemtech campus and showcase all of their facilities available to you for training purposes. That's all from me tonight, folks. Thank you. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, Jean, for that comprehensive update on what's happening in training. It's great to see uh, there's been many movements uh, since we last got to speak to you and that your team have been working so incredibly hard on updating us on, on training. And I look forward uh, to hearing from you next month and what, uh, what has been achieved. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that we have had some technical difficulties in the first part uh, of tonight's forum. Please don't worry. We have managed at our end to ensure uh, that there is a clean audio recording. So uh, post tonight's uh, forum, you will be able to go back uh, and watch the beginning of the, uh, of the live stream uh, without interruption or, or buffering. Uh, and a, a huge congratulations to the team behind the desk uh, that were able to quickly resolve the issues to ensure that we're back up streaming uh, at full strength. So uh, what, what, uh, what I did do in the meantime was acknowledge our fantastic AFSM recipients. Uh, and I do encourage you to uh, go back and watch the first pick to hear uh, some of their achievements and, uh, and some of the dedication that they have been working for. Um, I love a little uh, late news breaking item. Uh, so since uh, recording that video for us, uh, something big has happened uh, in the training space, and that is that we actually have uh, now received uh, from the VRQA uh, our full accreditation. So our RTO status has been uh, re-accredited and recertified for the next five years. Uh, and congratulations to the training team. It's been a tremendous effort uh, and you've managed to, uh, to get through that audit fantastically and uh, we're good to go for the next uh, five years. So uh, congratulations. I know many uh, have worked very, very hard across our regions and our districts uh, and our, our training department to make that happen. So Trevor, we're in District 9. Yes. Tell us about District 9. Why is it uh, the jewel of the South East region? <laughs> Well, it certainly is, Chief, and, and welcome to District 9. We've had a bit of a busy start to the season as well. We've had a, a few burns mm -hmm. uh, across our district, and our brigades have responded and stood up really, really well. Post-COVID, it was always a concern how our brigades would come back together, and I, I'm really pleased to say that I um, could not have been happier of the efforts of our members in, in responding. There's been some jobs up here in Trafalgar East, uh, right down to uh, Agnes down on the South Gippsland mm -hmm. and a few uh, few other minor uh, incidents in between. But we're still one of the uh, lowest drought index areas in the state. Mm -hmm. Even though coming through winter, some of our local farmers have recorded nearly second highest rainfall on record. So we've got a, a significant contrast of um, drying so rapidly and, and our curing really mm -hmm. went off real quick this year. And, and your brigades across the district um, really you know, range from your, your farming type brigades right through to, uh, to your urban type brigades. And you've got a really good mix of everything in between here, haven't you? We certainly do. Um, we, we go from the foothills of Mount Borbor to, to the, the prom. Uh, we've got um, a number of, well, I won't say the old urban brigade, mm -hmm. but we've got a number of um, 
class five brigades, class four brigades. So we've got a good mix um, right across our risk environment, right through the typologies in the hills to some of that significant industry, dairy industry mm -hmm. across our district as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, fantastic, and, and thanks for coming on the panel um, tonight to, to ask all the hard questions, and I'm sure we'll be coming uh, your way. Uh, thank you for, for coming. Uh, as, as always, we actually do have a, a live audience here uh, with us this evening who uh, have come along to, to watch uh, the forum, but also be prepared to, to come up for all the, the hard questions for Trevor, who uh, has promised to answer every single one of them. Um, but thank you for, for joining us, and uh, we've got members of the Ball Ball Group, uh, members of the uh, of the Drew and West Fire Brigade, and uh, we even have um, yeah, DPC Chair Ian here with us tonight. So we're amongst a, a good crowd uh, and some good people, and thank you very much for coming along this evening. It's greatly appreciated, uh, and, and welcome to uh, to the forum. Well, tonight's forum, as I said, was all about uh, community engagement and things that we do to prepare our communities uh, for fire. And we've got Bruce here. Bruce is our District 27 delegate of the Joint Community Safety Committee uh, and is also the Bore Bore Group Community Safety Coordinator. So That's welcome, true. Bruce. Thanks very much, Chief. I bet that keeps you very busy. Oh, it does. It does. It's, yes. But it's, it's an enjoyable role. I mean, the community engagement has been a passion of mine for many, many years mm -hmm. since Black Saturday. So I'm happy to invest my time and do what I can to support the brigades in Ball Ball Group. Awesome. Now, we've got something behind us here this evening. We do have. Tell us all about it. Well, look, thanks. And first of all, thanks, Chief, for um, allowing me the opportunity to talk about this wonderful vehicle. And you can see it in the background here. And I'll share a bit of experiences um, that I've found with the vehicle thus far. Um, I think I'll start off by saying these vehicles are fantastic. Having used them on a number of occasions, they are a great asset, great asset for brigades and really help them engage with their communities. The feedback that I've received from members um, so far is just how simple they are to set up and how easy they are to use. I've only got a few minutes to talk about the benefits. Um, those who know me will know that's a bit of a challenge, but I'll do my best <laughs> to keep to the um, five minutes. Um, so I'll just quickly touch on some of the benefits. You know, they can, they can be driven on a standard licence, plus it's an auto, so no manual changing of gears. It's easy to drive. I've driven it a number of times. I've driven it down here, all the way down to um, Venus Bay. Very easy to drive. It's got solar panels. Now, the great thing about the solar panels is you don't need that noisy generator to maintain the power, and I, the power is maintained. I said before I've used this on two occasions, both occasions more than six hours. Using the TV and all the other electronic facilities, um, basically the battery's hardly even drained at all. So it's wonderful that it's got the, um, um, you know, that it has got the solar panels. There's a large TV, you can't quite see it, but it's just in behind where he says, prepare for fire. Um, it's got a HDMI and USB port, so you can plug a laptop in there. You can plug a, a little memory stick with your videos, and here in South East, we're very fortunate that our lovely Kex provide us with a memory stick full of videos, so we can plug them in and play them to our community. There's a filing cabinet in the back that can store all the brochures and information that you need uh, for when you're engaging with the community, and once again, you know, our CACs in South East always make sure that it's fully stocked, ready for us to engage with our communities. There's multiple USB ports. There is multiple. So you can charge everything that you have, whether it's your phone, your tablet, whatever. There's a PA system. So if you need a little bit of help in communicating, very simple, little box, little Bluetooth microphone, and away you go. There's even free Wi-Fi. So yes, it comes with its own Wi-Fi. So anyone within 20 metres can hook into the free Wi-Fi that comes with the vehicle. There is plenty of space in there for additional giveaways that you may require. I would challenge anyone to try and fill it. It's, it would be very difficult to fill. It's just such a wonderful asset. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, if you haven't seen one yet, right, as a wise man once said, do yourself a favour, contact you know, your Brigade Community Safety Coordinator or your KEC and arrange a demonstration. I know once again in South East here, our KECs are more than happy um, to demonstrate it and show it off. Yeah. Now, I briefly told you about these wonderful 
assets, what's next? So if you're a brigade community safety coordinator or a member of your BMT, work together to develop a community engagement plan. And Alyssa's gonna talk a bit more about that shortly. Plus also, you can jump onto the members online and have a look at a virtual tour. So there's a virtual tour that'll walk you through the actual vehicle. I've been asked a few times, where can they be used? Basically anywhere. Anywhere where you're engaging with the community. So I talked before about you know, having a plan for the 2023, how you're gonna engage with the community and then look about how you're gonna be using the vehicle. But demand is high at the moment. Um, I would encourage you to plan ahead and book it ahead. I can tell you now in South East region, the vehicles here have been used on 50 occasions already. And, I, and it's just wonderful to see these vehicles out there. So I would encourage you to book early. Now I'm sure there's plenty of questions, Chief. So I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the opportunity to ask questions later, but I would encourage you to ask any questions at the end. So thank you very much, Chief. Uh, thank you, Bruce, and telling us all about it. Um, so Trevor, how important is it to have resources like this available in the district? Chief, we've got to be able to get our message to our communities and we've got to be able to build that resilience in our communities. And the best way we can do that is a method of engagement, how we sell our story and the takeaways and, and what they're going to go home and start to develop their own fire plans because we do have a significant risk, particularly to the north of us just here in the foothills around Jindavik, where Bruce and his team is, is out there encouraging the communities to, to understand those risks that are there a lot of the time throughout the, uh, the fire danger period and better prepare them. Mm -hmm. um, so Alyssa, you're a District 13 delegate on the Joint Safety, uh, yeah, Joint Community, Community Safety Committee. Sorry, That's right. a bit of a yes. tongue twister there. Yep. Um, for the Dandenong Rangers Group as a Community Safety Coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it that CFA has your know, access to things like the, the MEUs um, for you and your community? Um, it's super important. Um, Dandenong Range is one of the most fire prone areas in the world. So it's really important within the Dandenong Ranges, there's 15 brigades. Um, most of our brigades are in extreme risk areas. So we need to be able to access as many resources and having these vehicles just means that instead of putting everything into your car and driving to the event or whatever, um, lugging brochures around, everything's there that you need. So having everything in that one place um, is just really important. And it, the fact that it's so visually beautiful and appealing just draws people to it. And it's just something different than the big red truck. So people are interested, they want to know what it's about and they're sort of coming up and asking all the time, which is mm -hmm. great. Oh, fantastic. Um, and Bruce, if someone wants to get hold of, of an MEU and you know, uh, start using it, how, how do I get my hands on one of these? Um, it's actually quite simple. All you need to do is just, through your Brigade Community Safety Coordinator, talk to your local KEC, right, your Community Education Coordinator, who will help you um, book and arrange um, the use of these vehicles. But I'll go back to, you know, we need, Brigades, I would encourage them to plan ahead. So think ahead, um, demand is high, but certainly just contact your KECs. Mm, that's awesome. And they're wonderful support. Uh, well, thank you, Bruce, for coming along this evening and telling us all Pleasure. about it. It's a, it's a fantastic piece uh, of equipment and, oh, yeah. and tool for our brigades to use right across the state. Uh, and it looks fantastic. And a big shout out uh, to everyone involved in the, in the Mobile Engagement Unit uh, project. They've done a fantastic uh, job. There's been a lot of consultation with many mm. uh, departments right across uh, CFA, whether it be our community engagement teams, our fleet and engineering teams. Uh, it's been a collaborative effort uh, to get to where we are today uh, and it's a fantastic investment uh, in our Victorian communities. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I am aware and I do know that we are uh, continuing to have technical difficulties this, difficulty this evening with buffering and some connection issues. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to run the uh, forum as we are uh, right now to ensure that uh, it is recorded. We are getting a clean record so that you will have the ability to go back uh, and view this after, after the forum. So big apologies to everyone who is trying to watch it this evening but can't. Uh, I do encourage you to uh, log on to members online and be able to watch uh, the forum uh, at a later time. But we will continuing, uh, we're continuing on, we will continue to push through. So thank you to anyone that wants to uh, try and bear with us as we try to resolve uh, these technical uh, issues. 
So, uh, Trevor, um, again, I guess, as the, the local ACFO for, for, for District 9, um, one of the things I like to do, I guess, um, when I was talking to, to operational leaders to get an understanding of, I guess, one of some of the challenges in their area. Um, if we were to have a fire right here, right now in District 9, where would you not like it to be uh, and why? Probably about where we are. No. Um, <laughs> Chief, we've, we've got a lot of um, communities, as I said earlier, um, along those uh, foothills of the ranges, particularly to the north of us, where we, we are getting those uh, high level drought indexes that are probably some of the highest in the state. And they're, they're communities in there that often only have one or two ways out. So to us, um, they're not the places where we want fires to start. Mm. Uh, however, we, we do know traditionally we, we're going to get the, the bad days with the northerly and the northwesterly winds that will severely impact it. And we've seen it again with the Bunyip fire. Mm -hmm. um, but we had some good experienced people on the fire ground that actually witnessed the fire behaviour from, from previous years, particularly around Black Saturday, to, to have that good uh, fire ground knowledge. So more importantly, while we've got to get that community message out, particularly to leave early, because mm -hmm. when you've got uh, only one or two roads into some of these communities, that message is so important for the safety of the community. Uh, absolutely. And, um, and Boris, we, we have you this evening to, uh, to talk about uh, the community engagement guidelines. Um, tell us about right. the guidelines and how they help you know, Trevor and, and his district and, and brigades um, prepare our communities. Thank you, Chief, and good evening, everyone, uh, both here during West Brigade and uh, those who watch us uh, online. Um, so I'm pleased to talk today about community engagement guidelines, and uh, I'm pretty sure they are a uh, valuable resource uh, both for the brigades and also regions and districts uh, in order to help our communities uh, get uh, uh, prepared for fire. Uh, now we all know that engaging with community members is critical for CFA to achieve our uh, mission of uh, protecting lives and uh, uh, property uh, by building those skills, transferring knowledge and building some long lasting uh, connections. We really want to enhance the sense of sharing responsibility so that uh, we work together with communities uh, to achieve uh, uh, that sort of fire prevention and community preparedness uh, goal, if you will. Now, uh, we will probably all agree it's uh, easier said uh, uh, than done, and I appreciate all the challenges, and it's sometimes it's not one size fits all, so we might need uh, to adapt and tailor some of the messages and programs to the local communities. But again, uh, community engagement uh, guidelines do provide that important platform as they are pretty much a how-to guide comprising of all <clears throat> relevant uh, tools, uh, uh, templates, uh, national standards, and international best practice uh, mm -hmm. around community engagement. Um, you can always also find there uh, some learnings from the previous fires, but you can also uh, find more information about our compliance requirements, such as child safety, uh, privacy, OHS risks, and, uh, and so on. Um, obviously, uh, you, you are in the unique pos uh, position as uh, CFA uh, members to contribute to uh, community engagement uh, and help the communities be uh, fire ready. Uh, so I, I trust that uh, this is a great resource that will help you uh, first initiate, but then also plan, uh, deliver, and report on community engagement. Um, uh, we all know that when we approach these activities, you know, we wonder what is the problem we want uh, to resolve here, um, what are the actions that would lead to des the desired outcomes, and also what are the resources uh, we need, whether it's um, infrastructure, equipment, uh, vehicle, as Bruce mentioned, uh, with the uh, uh, MEUs, there is all sorts of uh, resources, but also on the day, how do you get that message across so that it resonates and sticks with community members and then they talk to their neighbors, friends, uh, to prepare the fire plan so that they are uh, ready and confident uh, if the incident uh, occurs. Um, so within uh, the guidelines, you, you'll find the, within the structure pretty much the uh, four categories, within initiate, plan, deliver, and report, uh, what some of the uh, processes uh, are. 
and uh, some of you will uh, find uh, some of these processes already uh, familiar, which is fine. For others, it will be a bit of a uh, brush up of the current knowledge, but uh, for some new members, it can be also uh, the, new, the new learnings and the new content that they need uh, uh, to navigate. Um, as we all appreciate, there is lots of intricacies around uh, you know, how we uh, do business uh, uh, in CFA, but I'm pretty confident that uh, with this uh, resource will help uh, achieve our strategic goal, which is uh, putting communities at the center of uh, what we do. And uh, the main premise of the guidelines is actually that community engagement is something that everybody at CFA can do, uh, no matter whether you're paid staff member or volunteer, if you're new or you've been here for a long time, uh, they do provide uh, uh, that sort of uh, uh, background knowledge and, uh, and the tools that you need to do uh, community engagement. Um, they're also a quality assurance mechanism for us because we want to ensure that what we do uh, really hits the mark and is uh, uh, right for our communities. Uh, and uh, uh, when you go and, and check the guidelines, you'll find also some important checklists there. So if you're not sure you know, whether a certain approach is right or if you've done you know, the right thing, you can always go back to the guidelines and, and check uh, uh, actually what's, uh, what's required. Uh, um, and uh, as uh, with any other activities, I would encourage you to talk to your brigade members, collaborate, get the access to guidelines through your local CAC. They would be uh, more than happy uh, to assist you. And there is expectation from now on that uh, uh, they are followed and adhered to in all community engagement activities. But look, we'll closely uh, watch the space and we also open for the feedback because this is the uh, first iteration and we understand if we might have missed something. So there is also an opportunity for you to tell us if something didn't work. If you want a bit more detail, we are more than happy to embed that in the next iteration and really help you add value and make the difference out there in the communities. Oh, that's awesome. So if I was a brigade that wanted to get into to doing community engagement, it's, it's probably a really good place to start to to get the guidelines and understand you know, uh, you know, some of those processes, as mm. you said, that plan, do, uh, act and report. Um, and it's really good you know, helping, you, helping you along the way. And I guess how important, um, uh, how important you know, is having guidelines available for our brigades undertaking uh, some of this uh, valuable work, uh, Alyssa? Oh, it's super important. I mean, it, it sets the standard of where we want, um, you know, where CFA would like brigades to be with their communities. Um, you know, community engagement, it's part of our core service delivery in everything that we do. So we're always constantly, always engaging with our communities and having a set of guidelines just helps everybody to sort of get on the same page and, and mm -hmm. it's really helpful, especially for brigades who are just new to community engagement. Yeah, and it really helps solidify, I guess, um, because community engagement programs are, you know, are not um, you know, whack together and just thrown out there or add a bit of water and something will grow. Like, they're, they're, they're evaluated, they're, you know, researched, they generally have grounding in, in good research. And I know we're going to have Lucy on the panel uh, soon, and I know that's some of her passion uh, about community engagement uh, evaluations and lessons and learning and putting that into, into practice. And um, these guidelines really do help us, you know, put that into action, don't they? 100%, absolutely. So I really hope that, that they will do. As I said, we are uh, still open uh, uh, for feedback, but uh, yeah, they are, they are a great resource. They've been actually created in consultation with our members. So, you know, we, we try to embed all the things that, that matter while they might uh, look a bit comprehensive at the first glance because there is uh, quite a few pages there to navigate. We're also preparing a bit of an overview and postcard so that members can find the key information on a, a few pages in the key contacts that they can reach out to. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Alyssa Bruce, mm -hmm. let's talk about your experience and uh, different communities that where you've been, where you've been doing this. So, talk me through, I guess, what have been some of the hard head communities that you've had to deal with, where it's a little bit, it'll never happen to me, <laughs> or you know, don't tell me I know boats. Yeah. How have you managed to crack through, break through, and start to engage with the community and get them thinking about preparing and fire safety? You want to go first? I shall go first. <laughs> um, great question, Chief. Um, a lot of our brigade members will have experienced members of their own community who have been around for a long time. So they might have um, experienced fire within that area or in other areas and 
Um, they may think that they've seen it all and they know it all. Um, but, you know, everything, you know, the environment's changing constantly. A lot of things are changing. Um, our programs and services are being updated on a regular basis. So there's always, there's always something new for people to discover. And I suppose being able to, you know, utilise what goes on in the community without having to drag people to the fire station, which we've traditionally done um, in the past, you know, meeting the community where they're at. So in you know, working with other local community groups, um, making sure that you've got a really good brigade community engagement plan. And um, it's something that um, the fantastic team at headquarters have developed over the last year is a community engagement plan template, mm -hmm. which you can find on the content portal. So you can go onto the content portal. There's a special tab that's been created for Brigade Community Safety Coordinators. So you can find the planning template in there. There's even a video that tells you everything you need to do. And if brigades are able to go through with their BMT and all their brigade members really, um, and go through each of the sections, it really helps um, brigades to understand what sort of you know, engagement activities they could do, who they should be considering, not just one particular group of people, but you know, all the people within the community. And remembering that we are the community, so um, we have that experience. But um, yeah, I think it's the hardest, the challenge is getting people to come back year after year, because some people think, oh, I've been to one meeting or I've been to one session, so I know everything, nothing's gonna change. So, mm. you know, and the importance of promoting our events that's one of the, you know, the biggest issues for brigades is getting it out there that we've got events on. So whether or not that's on our Facebook pages, doing newsletters or letterbox drops, um, using the What's On um, section of the CFA website, mm -hmm. so everybody sort of can go to there and see. But um, yeah, it's challenging, but lots of fun. Bruce, what about you? Yes. I was just thinking, um, you know, you just got to chip away. Um, for some people. Um, you know, it's just not going to get it done one, two, three, four visits. Some people require a number of visits. Um, for some people, we're actually talking a little bit about even about a changing of attitudes, and people's attitudes don't change overnight. So I would encourage brigades, if they're coming across people that are sort of, you know, they, they, it's not going to happen to me, oh, this is never going to happen to me, just chip away, just chip away, keep talking to them, keep engaging. If anything, try and encourage their neighbours to talk to them. Um, often people will listen to their neighbours um, and just chip away. And, and also don't think that this is going to happen overnight. Getting people to change their attitudes will take time. At Drew and West, we've been doing it here for probably nearly eight years mm -hmm. and um, we're still on a journey. So there's a... So I, I, you know, not many people would probably know why my, you know, my background was in community safety mm. uh, in New South Wales in, in, my, district, in my district time. Um, now, there's a little bit of a special recipe uh, <laughs> for, for dealing with communities and trying to, to, to do the community engagement aspect. And there's, there's, three, um, there's three words, really. Um, yeah, keeping it tailored, yeah, keeping it simple and relevant uh, exactly. to that local community. Uh, and that's a really, you need to understand the community first mm. before you go do that, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, there's so many tools available. You know, the community engagement portal um, via members online um, site, it's got everything that brigades need. So it's got a section for all the different programs that CFA have and the services, as well as all the resources for those. Um, all the publications, the current publications, brochures that are available. Um, as well as all the multimedia, social media tiles, videos, everything you need. So really encouraging all of your members um, in your brigade to look at the community engagement portal because that's where you'll find everything. It's, you know, it's the one-stop shop. And I'd also just like to um, have a plug to the state, the um, headquarter community engagement team for the last brigade magazine, three pages of community engagement with a whole table about all the different programs and services. Um, that CFA are offering at the moment. So I encourage everybody to read that. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sure the gang back in HQ are appreciative of, uh, <laughs> of the plug. Uh, no, fair thing. Now, um, Boris, I'm pretty sure we'll find something else on the, uh, on the internet there in the community you know, engagement section, and that's the, the capability framework. Tell us all about what is the framework mm -hmm. and, and how does it relate to what we're talking about tonight? That's right. Look, that's uh, just uh, another exciting project uh, we've been working on in the community engagement uh, headquarters team. 
And while the, the word uh, framework uh, might sound a bit uh, mouthful, what we really mean by that is uh, uh, a really great tool uh, in community preparedness and uh, prevention that help us uh, uh, build consistent and straightforward co uh, capability within our community and among the members. Um, so uh, the framework has been uh, created in consultation with, with members, obviously similar uh, uh, to guidelines, uh, but uh, it is quite different uh, uh, in terms of the nature in itself because uh, uh, the, the framework uh, embeds uh, the training uh, pathways which have been developed in conjunction uh, with the framework. And uh, uh, the pathways actually describe what training is available and uh, at what level, uh, while the capability framework on the other side sets uh, some uh, desired uh, uh, abilities, the uh, skills, uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, knowledge of uh, different uh, uh, roles uh, for community engagement. For example, a brigade member, a brigade uh, community safety coordinator, group community safety coordinator, and uh, a presenter. Um, so when it comes to implementation of this uh, uh, framework, uh, the capability uh, team uh, has really thought this through and created uh, uh, three uh, levels, uh, which, are, which will be uh, built into our learning uh, management system. Uh, the first level is a, a communicator. So it's pretty much uh, the training about uh, the basic communication skills, uh, so that you understand what's the community engagement, how to go about community engagement, understanding uh, fire risk, contextualizing that, uh, as you uh, said it rightly before, Chief, it, it's, uh, it's really about tailoring uh, that activity at the local level and understanding uh, the needs. And uh, you might wonder now uh, what, what will uh, this, uh, uh, this sort of training uh, help you uh, undertake and what, what sort of capability will be built uh, once you complete it and get endorsed. So it's pretty much uh, uh, the training that helps you uh, with uh, home visits. We are talking here about one-on-one -on -one sessions like uh, PAVs and also fire, uh, fire safe, uh, safe Kids, which has been uh, another popular uh, program of CFA. Now, as we are moving uh, within the tra training pathway, the next uh, uh, level is level two or the presenter level. And that's the one that we've spent quite a bit of time recently in terms of uh, revisiting that package. Uh, most of you will associate that with a, a CLAP training package and now we call it presenter package just because we did, uh, we've actually decided to uh, split their role and have a sort of a presenter role, if you will, and then the facilitator role which corresponds to the level three uh, within this uh, training pathway. Uh, so once you take a presenter training, then you're able to actually uh, deliver uh, fire safety essentials, which has been uh, another flagship uh, CFA program. And uh, you're also getting a bit more sophisticated skills in terms of uh, you know, monitoring and evaluation, reviewing, uh, reporting on the programs, uh, and uh, so on. And at that level, uh, there is some important resources here for BCSCs and GSCs. Uh, CSEs, and I think the, uh, I'm struggling a bit with acronyms as well. And uh, Elisa, I think you did me a favor and you mentioned some of those already on the content portal. So they are indeed available through uh, members online and uh, on the uh, Learning Hub. Uh, so we are talking here about uh, a brigade community engagement uh, uh, plan. Uh, so there is a template and our colleague uh, Jackie has been uh, socializing uh, this template for quite a while now at the regional volunteer forum so for you who attended it them last year you would be quite familiar with them uh, but sometimes you might also wonder what sort of uh, information you put in there uh, who, who you need to ask uh, for assistance so there is a, a nice video tutorial that uh, uh, covers those topics and there is also uh, another resource, which is an uh, e-learning module that's, uh, that's currently being built. There are actually uh, two e-learning modules, uh, one of them uh, for co uh, community safety coordinators and explains their roles and responsibilities. And the second one is pretty much about the risk-based uh, uh, community engagement uh, uh, planning process, uh, which, which should uh, help uh, uh, this template and uh, the implementation. Uh, I might have missed uh, just at the level one. I would like to go quickly go, go back in terms of the module that we have available uh, there, and that's uh, intro to community mm -hmm. engagement. 
uh, we've had quite a bit of popularity here, uh, more than 500 uh, uh, completions of this training, but we, we really encourage members uh, to uh, jump on a, a learning hub and uh, complete uh, uh, this uh, uh, e-learning module if you haven't uh, already, uh, because I'm sure you'll find some great information there and in conjunction with the uh, guidelines and uh, some other resources that will really enhance, enhance your uh, capability to deliver community engagement. Um, as we are moving uh, towards you know, the more uh, complex uh, uh, programs, uh, uh, we are going to build the advanced uh, module, uh, which is that level three for facilitators. And uh, that module will, uh, will help uh, uh, our presenters pretty much uh, uh, deliver uh, programs like emergency uh, preparedness uh, advice service, uh, community uh, fire guard, uh, uh, also fire uh, planning uh, workshops uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that you have been working on, uh, Elisa. So it's really exciting uh, journey and uh, something to mention is like, as members, you're not required to go through all these levels. It's really optional as we are moving towards volu a volunteer-led service delivery. We obviously want people to uh, undertake more of this training and build their capability. But if you reckon you know, you're know you comfortable at level one for the time being, that's fine. And maybe at the future stage, you might move to the mm -hmm. uh, following levels. But yeah, another great project and again, uh, I encourage uh, you to reach out to your local CACs and uh, uh, find out a bit more. Uh, awesome information there about uh, not only uh, the engagement guidelines, but the capability framework as well. Um, one of the, the things that I find from time to time is, uh, yeah, C as CFA, we report quite regularly to government on the great work that our volunteers do uh, in our communities uh, doing community engagement and preparedness works and the like, uh, and some of the and rolling out some of these these programs, so whether it be um, you know smoke alarm installation or you know doing some home safety fire safety visits, or property advice visits, or property advices, yeah, absolutely. So, um, Alyssa, one of the things, one of the frustrations I have sometimes is. Uh, I reckon our members are out there doing a fantastic job day in, day out, and sometimes I wonder whether we actually know all uh, of what our members are doing. So if we are doing community engagement events and activities uh, out in our communities, how best do we record it so that uh, when I get asked a question, uh, I can let government know how great a job you're doing? Absolutely. Thanks, Chief. Um, there are so many activities that are done at brigades that are not um, not reported, unfortunately. And we have an amazing tool at CFA, um, the art reporting tool, or the activity reporting, reporting tool, art as you call it. Um, you can access that, again, members online, the same place where the community engagement portal is. There's the activity reporting. You can do it on your phone. You can do it when you get home from an event. Um, you can do it there and then. And it basically records everything, um, goes into a central database, for the headquarters team to be able to put together little infographics and stuff mm -hmm. to present to you and give to the board on a regular basis. And it's, it's just really important that brigades do report on everything they do. And Boris mentioned the introduction to community engagement on um, that LMS module. And, and that's, I really would encourage everybody, whether or not you're you know, into community engagement or not, I would encourage all brigade members across the state to do that, to understand what is and what isn't community engagement and to make sure that everything that you do that is community engagement is reported, because it's, it's just so important that we celebrate all the, um, the successes that we have across our communities. And we really need, you know, headquarters need that data to be able to, you know, to show what we're doing, because our brigades are doing amazing amounts of work, and it's sad that it's not always seen, mm. so. so. Absolutely, so the art tool. Yep, the art activity tool. Activity reporting Activity reporting tool. tool. Not not finger painting no, or anything to do painting. with no. Van Gogh or anything no, like that. No. We're, not, we're not doing arts and crafts. We're no. doing activity reporting uh, of, the, of the valuable work that yep, it volunteers. Definitely. Uh, and it's also and, and page 34 of the Summer Brigade magazine. Ah, there it is. Um, <laughs> there's, a little, there's a little spiel on that as well. So <laughs> Absolutely. Look, it. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you for, for that information there. Um, so we have a, a question here. As I said, I do apologise again for anyone that is online that uh, has tried to stay with us the technical difficulties. Um, we are continuing to run through. Uh, we do have a clean recording, so we will be placing the volunteer forum on members online, so you'll be able to uh, to watch uh, tonight's forum from start to finish without any of that pesky wheel of death. We have a question from Ian. Yes, Tim. Um, 
In my experience, one of the difficulties with community engagement is that sometimes our messages run counter to what the community um, need to be able to do in the immediate period after the, part, the passage of the front of the fire. Traffic control, for instance. We tell people to leave early. One of the main reasons they don't is because they're worried they're not going to get back. And they've got animals and their property and they want to be there and look after it. Are we doing any work to address that sort of conflict between keeping them safe when the fire's at its worst and coming up with a way of allowing or facilitating mm -hmm. their return following the then we'll problem get somewhere the fire with our messages. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, look, it's a fantastic question. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, conundrum that you do pose because it's one that uh, our incident management teams really do grapple from time to time. And, um, you know, Trevor, uh, as an incident <laughs> controller, which I'm sure, I'm pretty mm. sure over the time of your career, you have been faced with that exact conundrum between, you know, advising people, providing those, that, that message, yep. particularly that... Um, you know, that watch and act, that, you know, the, the advice for people to leave, you know, leave now, or, or including uh, emergency warnings, you know, leave now, shelter now. Talk us through, I guess, how, how you balance off the message between that community preparedness, you know, leave, if your plan is to, to leave, leave early, or, um, you know, when the fire actually occurs. Yeah, it, it really is one of those difficult um, spaces to be in, and I cast my mind back to um, Black Saturday up around Marysville when it, it was pretty much in order to get people out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and people have got um, animals and uh, their, their stock that they, they really know that they needed to support and feed and water. So it's very important and those people do really need proper guidance. So um, my experience in incident management teams where we've been faced with this is We've really got to work with our public information officers to have a good strategy and establish some good timelines. Um, and when I say timelines, I mean triggers. So when, when a fire gets to uh, this point here, well, we're going to be providing them with the advice message. Uh, and the advice message will be clear that um, there will be further days of, of mm. greater fire activity. So the message is, is to leave early. Um, but if we, we're progressing and, and the fire develops, well, then we need to obviously um, build the messaging up to uh, evacuate or whether it's too late to, to evacuate. So mm. very difficult space. And we've got to work very closely with our colleagues in the emergency management team um, with Victoria Police, um, because there is areas where uh, we've, we've had to shut down roads or put traffic management points in locations um, for, a, for a greater geographic area because of the, the, the area, the road networks, mm -hmm. but to also get them opened up as quick as we can to allow people back in safely. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that takes a bit of work. Absolutely. Um, but I guess some you know, watching tonight would say, uh, but Chief, isn't that what a bushfire survival plan is all about uh, and having? So how important is it to have a bushfire survival <laughs> plan yeah, you know, Bruce, particularly when we, you know, Ian's question was around, yeah, you know, perhaps a reluctance to, to want to leave early um, or, in fact, leave an area when advised to do so by, by fire services. Oh. And you've got, you know, you've got animals, you've got things to, to, to look after. Um, the reality is you probably should have thought about it before the fire. Oh, absolutely, Chief. I think, you know, the, the people need to plan ahead. So... You know, if they're living in a high-risk area, they need to have a think about what are the risks to them and how they're going to try and help them mitigate the risks. Because being volunteers, we've, we've got our own properties to look after as well. So, you know, if you've got a lot of stock in that, then you want to have a bit of a plan about where's my stock going to go. And we've got some great information that can help the community understand how to manage their stocks during a bushfire. We've got some great information that will help them develop a plan on how to leave early, you know, or whether they choose to stay and defend, which, you know, some people would prefer to, you know, we've got some great information that can help them set that up. 
So and, the information's and there. The key is to, I guess, inform communities to know where to get that information in the lead up to. So, so if you're able to keep an eye on the fire dangers, uh, you know, the fire behaviour mm. index and understanding the fire danger ratings and the call to action throughout the fire danger ratings, um, you know, as we know, you know the, the moderate in particular, yeah, have a plan, plan and prepare. Um, you know, they're all the things that, and as you know, in a couple of days time, you might be looking at um, you know, a potentially extreme rating, then you know, it, to your point, you know, what am I gonna do with my stock? Correct. What am I gonna do with my animals? Because you know, there's a higher chance or a likelihood that on that day, um, I will need to put my bushfire survival plan into action. Uh, or leave early when the fire occurs has been the safest option. Absolutely. So, so it's about planning ahead, but also taking the opportunity to even, even practice what you're going to be doing so, so you know whether your plan is going to succeed and also whether you need to make some changes to your plan. So we, I know we keep banging on about having a plan, but and as people here, you know, all members would know, it's very important for us to actually help our communities have a plan. Absolutely. And as we all know, planning to have a plan is <laughs> not a plan. <laughs> and if you're a, a, a firefighter out there and you think that uh, I don't need a plan, because as we said before, you can't tell me I know boats, um, please uh, do yourself and your family a favour. Yeah. Download uh, that bushfire survival plan. Have the conversation with the family. Because here's the reality for, for many of our members. You're not going to be home when it happens. Because uh, I know that members will be on the trucks, they'll be out helping their communities, and many of us will have family and loved ones back at home. Uh, and the best thing we can do is to make sure that when we're going off to that fire call, uh, that on the, on, the, on the kitchen table or on the fridge on that bad day uh, is the bushfire survival plan. So many of our, many of our loved ones, uh, if any, they find themselves in that spot, can pick it up uh, and put that into action if, uh, if our, if our uh, members are not around. So, Bruce, thank you, Boris. Thank you uh, for Thanks your everyone. participation and conversation this evening. It's been fantastic. Thank We're you. We're about to uh, get some other panellists yeah. on this evening to continue this conversation. But in the meantime, uh, we heard from Jean uh, earlier about what training has been doing and uh, some of the great work that they've been doing, uh, not only in the uh, package development space and, and the like, uh, but it, we, training also wants to let our membership know of what great resources are available through our VEMTEC facility. So here's Dave Maxwell to tell us about our VEMTEC facilities across the state and uh, how you might be able to get access to them. Hello, my name is David Maxwell, Assistant Chief Fire Officer of Training and Delivery. CFA operates eight Victorian Emergency Management training campuses across the state and over the next few months we'll be featuring all of these facilities and their fantastic PAD staff in each volunteer forum. These campuses are located in West Sale, Bangholm, Mildura, Penshurst, Longrenon, Balan, Wangaratta and Huntley. They are purpose-built facilities that enable volunteers to practice their skills in a safe, controlled environment, simulating a variety of fires and incidents we may face operationally. The Vemtex have a wide range of facilities reflecting the risks of local districts and can be used by all members in the state often running multiple training sessions at the same time. Our campuses offer training for structural fire attack using breathing apparatus, ventilation and salvage techniques. Emergency management of transport and industrial risks. Hot fire training using industrial and domestic LPG installations. Electrical fires, hazardous material response and portable fire extinguisher use and safety. The Vemtex feature props to safely train in a variety of urban and rural situations such as structural fires, including commercial kitchen fires, and bedroom fires using multiple levels. Forcible and hot door entry, roof and ladder access, specialist rescue, such as confined space and trench rescue props. Additionally, our Vemtex maintain a range of props to simulate vehicle fires, including cars, trucks, trains, aeroplanes, fuel tankers, running fuel fires and road collision rescue, as well as urban response props, such as industrial gas fires, skip bins, LPG cylinders, electrical pole fires, solar panel props, and more. Some Vemtex also offer off-road driver training areas with cross-slope driving, steep inclines, moguls, and water and sand crossings. There are also static water sources, chainsaw training areas, and extinguisher pads. In addition to the emergency response training facilities, the campuses also have a range of classrooms, change rooms and locker rooms, as well as barbecue, dining, and kitchen areas. Training is generally organised through the group or brigade in liaison with district staff and can take place during the day or in the evening. You can find the booking form and additional information on the Members Online training page within the Resources section. 
Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you and your brigade attending one of our Webtech um, campuses we don't have an in the near future. Of a technical issue. Thanks, Dave, for telling us all about the Vemtech facilities, uh, where they are located and how you can get access to them. And, and I know uh, what, uh, I can still see the chat, uh, even though we are having technical video uh, difficulties. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of discussion uh, in the chat this evening around access to training and how we can get uh, involved. And certainly, uh, you know, accessing our Vemtech campuses right across the state is one way uh, that you can get access to the world-class training uh, that I know many of our instructors and PAD supervisors provide uh, to uh, our members. Welcome Lucy, welcome Jude uh, to the panel this evening and welcoming to, to, to the conversation and continuing to talk about uh, the PP of the PPRR uh, process. So, um, so Lucy, you're here to talk a, a, about uh, a couple of things this evening, in particular uh, post-fire services reform and what it means to be doing community engagement, particularly on the fringe areas mm. of uh, CFA and FRV um, districts. And Jude, we'll talk about more broadly across the South East region, I guess, and some of the great work that you've been doing um, in, that, in that community engagement uh, aspect. So, but before we get to that sort of uh, area, I'm gonna, I wanna talk about the elephant in the room, and that's um, how important is community engagement and connectivity to operations? Because when I was a community safety officer, I used to be accused of being a pamphlet chucker, uh, because that's how <laughs> Some of the, the operations people seem to view us, the people that are very passionate about, uh, about educating communities and preparing. So how important is community safety and community education and operations? Who wants to tackle that one? I, I can start us off and then you, you can want. talk yep. about the experience that you've seen, I guess. The research tells us that it is the most important tool we have to saving lives. So you know, when I talk about engagement and, and community preparedness, I'm talking about that, that whole systems mm. aspect around legislative change, advocacy, um, resourcing for community ca capability and connectedness. Um, so, you know, the research and the evidence is really, really mm. clear on the fact that we will save more lives um, getting people to look after themselves and either eliminating or reducing mm. the risk for themselves then we will if we get there when a fire's already started. And so it's not just about community lives. We're actually talking about firefighters' lives as well. Absolutely. So particularly when we talk we look at you know structural fire safety, you know, mm -hmm. dangerous goods and those sort of things, a lot of that uh, and, and some people probably don't think that that sits within community safety um, uh, portfolios, that the actions that get taken there are actually also designed not only to keep community safe, but to primarily keep firefighters safe as well, which is operations to me. Yeah, look, it's the spectrum, isn't it? So, and they're all connected. Um, so there's actually opportunities during response and recovery, and you, you spoke about that earlier around the information aspect and the um, uh, communicating with community around warnings and messages. And I think, you know, the community's very attuned to taking action if they've just seen a fire on their mm. street or if they've just seen a fire in their neighbour's property or, or in their grandparents' um, region or, or something like that. So I think that the, the spectrum is interconnected and it's all happening at once at some, at some stages. Um, but yeah, look, it's very complimentary. I, I always um, say there'll, there'll always be fires, even if we do the best prevention and preparedness possible. We live in fire country. There'll always be uh, the work of suppression to do, but our, um, our work can be really greatly enhanced and minimise, um, you know, risk of fatality and injury both mm. to ourselves and the community if we, if we invest in this really, really well. Absolutely, and, um, and the, you know, we're coming up on some pretty serious anniversaries and recognition events. Obviously the, um, yeah, the, the anniversary of Black Saturday in 09, but uh, even bigger, the 40 year anniversary of the 83 Ash Wednesday uh, bushfires. And to your point around when there's fire in the landscape, when there's fire in the hills, people tend to take notice and do certain things. Um, Trevor, what's your experience? We haven't, yeah, we had 1920. Um, it's rained, arguably, in a lot of places for two years since. Um, what do you think that does to community sentiment, community awareness, I guess, and having the forefront of fire protection uh, in, in, in communities' minds? 
To me, um, observation with community becomes um, complacency. And we've got to break down those barriers of complacency so we get our message through. Because if, the, if the, the mindset of the community is it, it's wet, it's raining, it's not going to happen to us, um, that, that's where it's so important to tailor our messaging to get through that barrier because mm. we do have that risk here mm. right now. And um, what's your experience been, Jude? Yeah, so you're right. I suppose um, looking over the last few years, Chief, where we've seen, um, you know, we haven't had those fire seasons, community is getting complacent. Uh, and we need to actually start thinking about um, how we're approaching next summer. Like this summer's here and now. Yep, we're going to get some hot days. Um, but I think um, the work, we've got significant parcel of work to do between now and next summer. Um, to actually bring the community back on board. I think we've had a number of events with COVID um, and we've, we've just got to get back, in that, mm. back into that mindset about preparing community. What did COVID do for community engagement, Lucy? Well, it changed the way we work. Mm. So suddenly we couldn't go door knocking anymore. We couldn't get people into our brigades anymore. Everything that we used to take for granted and do as business as usual was turned on its head. Mm. Um, so to the CFA's credit, the community engagement staff and volunteers were, I believe, the very first to pivot, which was a, a great <laughs> word in the COVID era, and, um, and do things differently. And we actually set, I suppose, a new way of working and transformed our service delivery model before any of the other fire services mm -hmm. and even the other emergency services. So we essentially transformed all our programs to be able to be delivered online into people's homes. Um, and we created tools and resources and platforms to be able to do that um, and training for mm -hmm. our people to be able to do that. And, um, and we set a new way of working that became a bit of a model for other agencies. Mm. So um, that's now been adopted and, and dispersed in Victoria through MCOP. Um, but also nationally uh, through our AFAC partners, they've sort of looked at what we've done and gone, oh, we should get in on that. So we got in there pretty early and we've actually managed to engage whole new audiences who never would have come to our fire mm -hmm. stations or never would have really gotten out into the places that we were getting to. So it's been a really fantastic opportunity, I think, for CFA mm -hmm. to, to reach, new, reach new people. Guess, yeah, something new to... Um, yeah, holding that street meeting down by Zoom Lane um, <laughs> and bringing the, you know, bringing the, pardon the pun, um, bringing the, you know, the community together online uh, in their own living rooms, in their own environment. And I guess it is quite novel when you're sitting, I guess you're sitting there, you might be looking out across the porch, listening to the CFA, you know, talk about preparedness and the rest of it. And they're, they're, they're looking at it. They're looking at their property. They're sort of thinking about it in their mind as opposed to sitting in a fire shed like we are. Um, yeah, and then going home and thinking about it. So uh, certainly to be congratulated, Lucy uh, and the team for how you were able to pivot, as you say, the, the, the word, because um, we, we really did, were able to continue uh, that, that essential work. Um, so Lucy, I've got, a, I guess, a question uh, for you that I'm sure uh, many people would ask. Um, can I do community engagement in an FRV district? Well, the answer, Chief, is a big fat yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, we have legislation that really empowers us to be able to deliver community engagement services anywhere in Victoria. Um, and since the reform took effect, there has been a little bit of confusion, especially for um, brigades that are in co-located areas or that are on the fringe um, that previously served these communities. And now these communities are technically within a FRV district. What does that mean for the brigade? Well, what it means is that you can still deliver community engagement to your communities. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we just haven't had um, real clarity on how that looks up until now. Um, so we've managed to um, develop a an operational bulletin which in black and white really spells out yes you can deliver and this is how you do it so I really do encourage everybody to have a look at that ops bulletin when it comes out which should be you know in the next few very very shortly um, but the process just really empowers our volunteers to be able to say well yeah no I have a right and I have an ability to deliver community engagement um, to these communities that happen to be in mm -hmm. FRV districts. And I would say so too do FRV yeah, have the ability mm. to come into the country area of Victoria because, you know, what we saw in Mallacoota, for example, was that a lot of the people who were affected, they weren't actually from there. 
They yeah. were in the metro areas. So there's a real need for us to be fluid, just like our people, and deliver community engagement to our target audience, wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, historically, um, we would go to the Royal Melbourne show, for example, because a lot of farmers would come into those areas and they'd, it's a lot easier than to get out to each farm, which is, you know, distance, the tyranny of distance made that a really huge job. So, um, you know, just as we might come into metro areas or into FRV districts to hit a, a mass group of people that are, that are congregating because they live or work there, um, so too might FRV want to come into a country area from time to time. So the principles around how does this look, it's really about saying, well, we want people, and Bruce talked about this earlier, we want people to plan ahead. We want to, you know, community engagements, it is a planned concept. It's not something you just do um, ad hoc and you know without thinking it is a it is a planned process that's how we define community engagement so um, we really are looking for brigades to work out what they're going to do ideally for the whole year but if not for the month ahead so have a good plan for the next month and um, you know get that chain of command approval within your CFA chain of command to make sure that your captain's aware of what's going on that your BCSC knows what's happening um, as a volunteer that you're going to conduct this engagement activity in the FRV district once that approval's been given, um, the operation bulletin explains that you are to communicate that to your, um, to your FRV district ACFO three weeks before the event to give them a heads up that, hey, this is something happening in the FRV patch. This is what it's going to be. This is why we're doing it. So this is the community need. Um, and, you know, it, it's really a notification. We're not asking for approval. We're letting them know that this is happening um, and giving them a few weeks notice. So, so what happens if, uh, so let me throw some hypotheticals oh, at you. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we've been contacted by the local you know, childcare centre or preschool. Uh, they'd, they'd love for the fire truck to come down and maybe do a, um, you know, a bit of a home fire safety evacuation type drill with, uh, with the kids. It's in an FRV district um, currently, but the CFA brigade may, may, may have gone there before. Um, you've notified the district. Yeah, there's been that communication to FRV. Um, and they say, no, 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 we want to do it. <coughs> yep. So I'd say if FRV, so you've told them three weeks prior, we're going to do this engagement because the school's asked us, and FRV comes back maybe that day, no, no, we've got this covered, um, then I think we would say, well, we need to really reassess whether we need to be delivering that, or if FRV can do it, then maybe we need to look at another community in need. Um, however, I would say if it's closer to the date, you know, it's tomorrow or it's next week and we've made all the plans, we've done the logistic arrangement with the school, we've built that relationship and FRV said, oh, well, we will do it, but we don't know when we'll do it and there's sort of not that strong commitment of, yet we're going here on that date. I would say you can reconsider whether you need to go there, but I would say you don't necessarily have to not do it at all. Um, you know, an option might be to work with the FRV staff to say, well, do you want to come in and let's do it together? Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, there's, we do have slightly different programs with slightly different outcomes and outputs. Um, so while we're not looking at co-delivery at this stage, although that would be amazing in the future, um, we'd certainly be um, offering, whether, whether they're saying they want to do it or not, we'd certainly be offering for FRV to attend and, and have a look at mm -hmm. our sessions um, so that they can at least be present and make those connections with the community as well. Um, yeah. so, so we want that, I guess the, the word is, we want that collaborative approach. You know, so it's not binary, it's not one or the other, it's really about talking about, uh, talking to your, your, your FRV station locally, uh, to the FRV staff. Uh, now whether the brigade does that or whether that's through, through the district or the, or the like, because um, it's about getting, a, I guess, an arrangement in place where, because at the end of the day, it's about community. It's about meeting yeah. the safety needs of That's the community. It, and addressing yeah. the needs of the community. So uh, we actively encourage people to, uh, to get out, uh, engage with the community, spread that fire preparedness and fire safety message. And as you've heard it from Lucy tonight, it doesn't matter whether it's in a fire district uh, or not. Uh, however, common courtesy uh, and a bit of collaboration, speak to your FRV counterparts. Uh, and have that conversation and between the two, um, you know, be able to, 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 to work that out. And I think that's probably a really good way of working jointly because, um, you know, it, together, you know, we can yeah. get a lot more done than, 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 um, than not. So uh, absolutely um, fantastic. We have a, a question in, our, uh, in the audience and uh, Ruth, over to you. Thanks, guys. It was really interesting hearing that conversation about what's changed in COVID. And of course, one of the things that's really changed for all brigades is the community's moved online, which means community engagement through Facebook 
has been really powerful. I want to give a shout out to the social media group at CFA who produced the tiles. But I guess the point of this is that centralising social media messages really helps brigades. It's low hanging fruit of what we can do. And I'd like to ask you to do more in that space, particularly around here. We've got a lot of weekenders and the tree change that's come post-COVID. Um, we want to be able to reach them while they're in Melbourne and they might not be on our Facebook. So if you could look at innovative ways of social media. So I know you've got Instagram, but using influencers that get to the Melbourne people. YouTube with funky people. I mean, even TikTok, right? 80% of Australians have got a Facebook page now, but that skews to the mature end. None of us are good at TikTok, but if you can do that in head office and then give us tiles that we can put out on Instagram, that would really, really help us to engage those people that we can't door knock but they're online, thanks. Great, great suggestion and, and, and comment there, Ruth. And um, uh, you, you've just put a smile on the face, so I've got to tell you, of, uh, of the entire young members group who have been <laughs> trying to get me to do a TikTok dance uh, for the last uh, two years. So thank you for reminding them. I'm sure they'll give me some stick about that uh, at our next Young Persons Advisory um, Committee. Um, so Lucy, from the research and some of the evaluations and the like, how important, uh, as Ruth touched on that social media connectivity and the like, how important is things like that medium to trying to connect to communities and send a, you know, send a message? Yeah, thanks, um, Chief. So a lot of our research at the moment in the community engagement space is focusing on a fairly new, um, I suppose, school of thought and academia called behavioural insights. And that is really looking at how do we change behaviour? How do we motivate people? What are some of these elements that are being used in marketing specifically? And how can we take all that amazing stuff that's been going on, well, since Mad Men really, mm -hmm. um, and kind of adapt that for a safety purpose? So. Um, Ruth touched on some uh, some great stuff there, which was the social element. So that's, you know, if someone is in your social network who's doing it or someone who you aspire to be is doing it, that can be a really powerful influencer. Um, there's, there's some other sort of elements that we're looking at which come under the what we call the EAST framework. So it needs to be easy. Mm. We, we've got to stop asking people to do this and this and this and this in this way and in this way. So, you know, a lot of our program design is now looking at, well, how can we simplify things? How can we make things not only easier for our community, but for our brigades to actually deliver? Mm. How can we just make almost like break down our programs to build them into little modules and building blocks? And you can pick and mix the lolly bag that you want to deliver to your community. Um, the, timely, the timeliness of it. So again, that's another, um, the EAST framework talks about having um, messaging that's really timely. So it's you know, we have winter campaigns, we have summer campaigns. Um, we do have, uh, and I would say to Ruth also, have a check out of the content portal because there's a lot of static um, stuff that can be taken by brigades and used for their own social media pages so that they can um, tailor the content really to their, to their community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of research that we're using. Mm -hmm. We use a lot of um, data and evidence garnered by the CFA knowledge team. So the post-season surveys, we go to areas that have been affected by fire and ask them, what have you done since this fire? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about CFA? What did you do last fire? So we're using that insight and intelligence as well. Mm -hmm. And we're using other um, sort of risk platforms. So using the latest um, statistics of the Australian Bureau of Statistics, to look at our communities and say, well, who, who's actually living in these brigade areas? What do they look like? And you know, the data's quite up to date now because we've just had the ABS rollout. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's got a lot of insights mm. in there. And I think combining that data and research with the valuable intelligence of brigade members like, um, like Alyssa um, is, is the perfect mm. mix. So Because the, the reality is we are uh, a diverse community mm -hmm. from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, and we know um, yeah, that we have communities that are popping up you know, everywhere. Uh, we are a rapidly expanding um, city and, and population centre uh, here in Victoria. And it's really about understanding the community, isn't it? Like, and then once you understand the community, then you can connect better to them. So if I'm going into a, a Chinese community, for example, that where English is not the first language or is a low proportion, then going in and telling people to you know, clean their gutters, you know, speaking English is probably not going to achieve much, is it? 
or same like when you tell a child that they need to work on a fire plan and they're dealing with domestic violence at home. Mm. You know, mm. there's, I think the better we understand our communities and what they're facing in terms of their risks and their capabilities, the better we can support them and fill that gap where we need to, but also step back and let them do for themselves mm. where they're able to. So it's really, yeah, understanding yeah. their capabilities. And I really like, I guess, your discussion point around the simplicity. Uh, and that simplicity led to a revision of the Australian you know, National Fire Danger Rating System and the reduction uh, of the ratings uh, that we have now. Because to, to be perfectly frank, if uh, the rest of Australia is like me, anything more than three things, and you tend to <laughs> tend to forget a few. Uh, so you know, it is about, as you say, getting it simple, not going out and telling people to do a list of things. Uh, because by, the reality is, by the time you get past the fourth item, odds are. You know, they're going to forget or they forgot for, you know, the first few. So, um, and I think that's really key to understanding and delivering some good, good programs, isn't it? It is. It was really fascinating to go through the research for the AFDRS because we as fire services obviously knew best and we had a really clear idea of what we thought the ratings should look like. And here's the community saying, no, it should look like this. And um, I think just listening to the community is going to be that key. And, you know, we are one of our strategic objectives is to put the community at the centre. The more we can co-design and co-deliver with community. Mm. And when I talk about co-delivery, I, I mean for brigades, not necessarily trying to get the community to come to you, but actually working with your rotary, your lions, your schools, um, your co-health, you know, your community health, your council, the more you can work in partnership, the 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 more reach that we can have and the more we can influence that social element. Mm. And, you know, we're not always the people that um, community want to hear from, even mm. though we are the fire experts. Sometimes, you know, students learn best from their teachers. So working with teachers to deliver those fire messages mm. in schools is a lot more powerful and it's actually easier for us because it means we don't have to be there front and centre all Absolutely. the time. Absolutely. And, and I guess the other challenge for us, and particularly uh, in our First Nations populations and, and the connection to country, but also the connectivity to the elders. Mm -hmm. yeah, and to your point, yeah, we can stand there uh, in a uniform. Yeah, I, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help, but the reality is you're probably not going to break through as best as you could if you engage with the community, engage with the elders and use those networks to, you know, to A, establish trust uh, in the fire service and what we're here to try and uh, help people do, but then also get them to... Um, you know, do what you know what we would like them to do, and that's that's prepare. Yeah, and I've got to say, Jude's does a lot of that in southeast region. So working with the multi faith community, yep. um, and yeah, getting. I mean, you can talk more about that, but that's something that the brigades are really getting awesome. into. So we might just hold it there, uh, Jude, because I think we, we're going to go there, uh, <laughs> and I, I get a sense that we're going to be end, uh, talking quite a lot about that. But we have Ian again with another question. Because Ian's an old bloke, and. Not all us old blokes use Facebook or are comfortable with social media and even the farmers of, you know, the farming population is getting older. They use it as a tool for what they do on the farm, but that vehicle there is the best way to get through to older people, face to face, talk to them, and what a great asset to have so many of them spread around and stuff. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. And that's probably a nice little segue um, into what you were just mm. about to talk about, Jude. So how do we connect with you know, our various aspects of the, of the community, whether you be you know, very young through to old, um, very, you know, multi-faith, multicultural? How, how have you managed to do that uh, in the South East region? Um, it's been quite a journey. So even with our multicultural community, um, communities across the region, it has been challenging and we've been quite lucky. We've had um, some, some staff members that have been very passionate about our multicultural engagement. And it starts off by just connecting with um, those faith leaders, those community leaders, and, and it builds from there. So it's about, you're right, it's about actually just having a conversation and building relationships and connecting in and then and then like from little things big things grow um, and that then enables that that trust um, to be invited to ifta dinners um, to 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 other multi-faith um, and 
faith events. And you know that that's when you start to get the cut through. And we've got a couple of really, really strong brigades. Uh, I think Keysborough, Noble Park, they're very strong in acknowledging them in actually that multicultural community. Um, um, so that's what one of, uh, that's how some of those brigades been actioning. You know, in the past we've had, um, uh, we've done a program which was called Next Gen, where we engaged with uh, some um, high schools with significant multicultural communities, um, a lot around um, Afghani communities, where we'd work in collaboration with Australian Federal Police, SES, Surf Life Saving, um, Victoria Police and CFA, um, MFB back then, uh, and we'd run um, like an open day event at fire stations and like a careers day to, to engage and break down those barriers of what the uniform sometimes can represent to some of those communities. Um, so that's worked extremely well and our brigades are currently working on through little programs like that at the moment. Uh, and we've got other things coming up around that uh, working with our Indigenous communities, meeting at, um, you know, uh, at uh, the gathering places and working well through, the, through there to engage with those communities is really important. So we spend a bit of time at our gathering places um, and we need to reconnect as with COVID we have to stop doing some of that work. Um, again, working um, you know, down at Lake Ties with the trust down there and engaging with that community, it's really important. Uh, hopefully getting some plan burns done in that, that location as well. Um, so just building trust, and again, when, when it's the First Nations, just trying to work on that caring and connecting back to country is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and showing that we, we do that, and we, we do that honestly. Um, and, and again, it just, that's probably some of the work that we've been doing um, in South East around trying to engage with multiculturals. And we know that in our growth areas, certain growth areas, we're starting to see uh, increase in certain types of multicultural groups coming in. So mm -hmm. um, we see, um, uh, uh, an Indian Tamil movement into the southeast, which is a bit different and new to some communities, and how we actually engage with that is a lot different. How we've engaged with maybe our Vietnamese communities in the past around Springvale, so yeah, it's it's always moving, and it's the new emerging communities um, that are really not I wouldn't say challenging, but actually um, you get a lot of joy out of working with that. I know even uh, in District Nine, we've got a um, a certain multicultural group that likes to come up through uh, up in the Wahala at Cooper's Creek. Um, so um, through some observations from Victoria Police, we've engaged with them back where they reside, back in the Metropolitan mm -hmm. District. So and we've is, actually had some success there. Um, so is it uh, is it just as simple for a brigade to throw open the door, sit back, and say, "Come on in," and I'll tell you all about it? <laughs> no, <Nah. laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's quite challenging. I think brigades, um, you know, some. You know, the best thing is a brigade would actually just try and um, would open the doors, would actually just try and find that faith leader or that, that key, key group they want to work with and just slowly chip away at it, like Bruce would say. But, you know, our, there's probably someone in the brigade that might know that group already. So, you know, it's just about the, the stronger the brigade is connected with the community, the stronger the brigade is. And that's the strength of CFA, you know, um, community, based fire and emergency service and I think that's some of the strength that we have as an organisation that you know, many of the people that form the brigades are from the community so we know our communities, we know our people in our communities and that's why I think you know, in a lot of ways it is easier for us sometimes to be able to connect with those community leaders in order to get that, as you say, build that trust and then once we build that trust be able to uh, move you know, the community to an area where we would like them to get to in terms of fire um, fire safety. Uh, we have another uh, question here uh, this evening and over to you Pauline. Hi, um, thanks for the opportunity. I'd just like to know um, where we can get additional support from. We're a very busy brigade um, getting out there within our community. We've been really busy in the last few weeks. We've had Australia Day, we've been out at um, Creative Harvest this weekend. Um, trying to organise all these things when you're working full time and um, you know, commitments elsewhere. I do a lot of my requesting for things on the weekend um, and then that's taking away from the weekend when you're working full time. Some systems that we could put in place that it's not we're always thinking, oh, we've got to get our head and order this and we've got to do this and we've got to do that because the weekends come around pretty quick and then we're behind the eight ball. Um, we have the, an opportunity to use the vehicle um, on our march 
Jimbeck market, which we'll bring out to talk to our people about. But it's just trying to gather all the resources and then, um, like when I've ordered it, it's got to come from somewhere else and I'm thinking, okay, now we've got to work out how we're going to bring it up. So it's a lot of those things and I know our um, community leader engagement um, at the District 9 has said she'll organise to get it here for me. But it's then making sure that I get that part done and that part done to get it to that stage. I just what I guess I'm saying is there going to be more support given to us volunteers who are doing more and more and more um, in the future. Mm -hmm. Great question. I think a really good insight to some of the challenges that our brigades have, particularly our busy brigades mm -hmm. uh, on the on the urban uh, bush or grass uh, interface. Um, who wants to? tackle this uh, question. So I can with help of Alyssa, I think. Yep. <laughs> um, so in terms of how we're going to support volunteers, there's a whole systems approach that needs to kind of happen, I think. So we need to recruit more people who are willing to dedicate their time to just this stuff. Um, and I don't think that's been as much of a focus as it can be. So we're working really closely with the um, volunteer sustainability team to really understand what a targeted marketing campaign will need to look like. Um, we've been working, as Boris talked about, the capability pathway. So we now have a, a, at least a career sort of um, a career pathway for people who come in, which we've not really had articulated previously. I'm really keen on looking at um, this. Will be news to you. I'm really keen on getting medals, you know, awards that are dedicated for this work that value it just as much as um, fire suppression work. Um, we've got epaulettes, you know, we've got some fancy bells and whistles. So this whole rewards and um, engagement sort of uh, thing that will help not only create a bigger workforce, but retain that workforce. Um, and then we've got these resources like the MEUs, which I'm hoping will be that one-stop shop. So you don't need to pull brochures and things like that from all the, all the places. So we've got the MEUs and I would say to our brigades out there, please flog them, flog them to death because the more I can prove through data that they're being used, the better business case I can have to say we need more of these. So, you know, use the assets that, that you've got. And in terms of, you know, we've got a casual pool of staff that are also there to support volunteers. So if you're feeling overwhelmed or at capacity, that's something that the regions are able to kind of plan, plan with you to make sure that the key activities are covered. Um, uh, Alyssa, did you want to add some other, I mean, there's a group level support. Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. That's what I was going to mention, Lucy, that, you know, we've all got our groups and within those groups, we've got X number of brigade community safety coordinators that, you know, they know they're within from within the same district or the same group. So we know the area. Um, we're able, you're able to reach out to those people and ask them. And I think one of the most important things is, you know, what you mentioned, Lucy, around that target recruitment. You know, every time, um, you know, brigades are wanting to recruit members, we need to be thinking about what do we need those members for? Are they for operational purposes, daytime crew, other crew? Are they to do fundraising? Are they to do community engagement? And, you know, having the support of the volunteers and sustainability team in putting together and talking to your KECs um, about trying to put together some amazing recruitment ads that you can put on Facebook. You can do a newsletter drop, a flyer drop throughout your community and asking people to specifically join their brigade for the purpose of community engagement as non-operational members. And then sometimes, I mean, I joined our brigade as a non-operational member with no real thought about becoming operational, but my captain at the time suggested that that would be better and would enhance and, you know, we ended up with another operational member. So, you know, being able to, you know, I suppose, really try and find people that are passionate. Because I think we're all a little bit crazy and passionate in the world of community safety, because, you know, you really have to be. Because it is, it's tiring work. It's, it can be a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And the more members that you've got in your brigade to support you and building teams, and, you know, we have one brigade community safety coordinator, but there's probably other members within our brigades who really want to help, but they just, you know, don't not necessarily know where to begin. So. I would encourage everybody to, you know, talk to their brigade community safety coordinator and get their captains on board. It's really important to have that support from your captain that really supports your brigade doing the work that you're doing in community safety and trying to encourage more members to, you know, especially if you're, you know, if we're doing amazing community safety and our turnout numbers are low, then we need to keep our members engaged. So there's a whole lot of community engagement work that needs to be done. So. 
Uh, thank you, and thank you, Pauline, for that uh, fantastic question. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's come to that time of the evening again where uh, one must wrap it up for another volunteer forum. Uh, once a couple of things uh, in finishing up. Firstly, I want to thank very much uh, our panellists this evening, Trevor Roberts, Alyssa Jans, Bruce Jewell, Jude Kennedy, Lucy Cerrone and Boris. Thank you very much for coming on uh, this evening and having, well, I think, a great conversation around community engagement uh, and preparedness. Uh, again, uh, apologies for the technical uh, issues we had. Uh, the team behind the desk have done a fantastic job this evening to uh, ensure that recording is kept going uh, so that we have been able to uh, make this available to you to be replayed on YouTube uh, at the conclusion of this or on members uh, online. So thank you to the team. I know you spent most of the afternoon testing the equipment and making sure that it works as you do before every volunteer forum. Uh, but as they say, it, uh, when it happens, it happens, and uh, it certainly has tonight. So thank you to the team, uh, and I thank you to everyone for, for staying with us throughout, uh, throughout this. Uh, if you have feedback, I'd love to know what you think about the forum, in particularly what some of the things that you would like to hear about talked uh, on the forum panel. And you can send that through to internalcoms at cfa.vic.gov.au, and the internal comms team uh, are, are really wanting to know what you think of the forum, but also uh, some of the things that we can uh, that we can talk about. Uh, we won't be having a February volunteer forum, just for, I guess, information of who. And that's because we're going to have a very special edition of the volunteer forum, uh, broadcasting from Penshurst uh, Vemtech facility on International Women's Day, where we will be celebrating the women uh, of CFA and hearing from them uh, and some of the great achievements that, uh, that they have and one of the things that we are absolutely going to be. That will be on the 8th of March. So please put it in your calendar now, as I know many of you will. Uh, and so thank you, yeah, thank you for, for, I guess, for coming along uh, this evening. As I said, uh, put the 8th of March in your diary for that special uh, volunteer forum. Uh, in closing, as I said earlier throughout the forum this evening, we have two uh, anniversaries coming up that for many uh, will bring back memories and, uh, and emotions uh, of the experiences of our brigades through that, whether that be part of Black Saturday in 2009, or in fact, the Ash Wednesday bushfires uh, in 83. We'll be commemorating the 40 year anniversary uh, in Cockatoo uh, for the uh, Ash Wednesday fires. In fact, there'll be many ceremonies held right across the state, whether it be in the surf coast, or in fact, I will be joining the Narry Warren Brigade um, uh, up in the upper Beaconsfield, uh, a particular site sacred to, uh, to them. So wherever you are, uh, please uh, stop, think, reflect uh, on the sacrifices made of many of our members in the communities during those uh, tragic events. But if you are struggling, if you do need assistance, please uh, reach out to uh, members online and the member support uh, there. The, the team are, are able there to provide that assistance to you and information available is on members online. Remember, it is okay not to be okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the live audience for coming this evening. Thank you for asking some of those questions, obviously, that we couldn't get them from uh, from the chat here this evening. Uh, it's been fantastic to have you here this evening. Um, I, like you, are waiting for me to be quiet so we can get out the back for a cuppa and a scone. Uh, so with that, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and uh, thank you for Drew and, to Drew and West uh, for allowing us to come and gate crash your station this evening. Stay safe and have a great evening.